Today I'm uh, very pleased to um, introduce um, the, the speaker or the speakers, um, but starting with uh, Arnak Dalalian, who will be speaking about his paper, uh, Theoretical Guarantees for Approximate Sampling and Log Concave Densities. Uh, so this was uh, published in Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series B in 2017, and it was selected by the RSS uh, Journal's webinars committee as uh, as deserving of a, a second airing. So we'll we'll start with um, Arnak, who will uh, who'll give a, a presentation of the paper, and then we have uh, discussion contributions from Hani Doss and uh, Alain uh, Dermu. So uh, take it away, Arnak. OK, uh, so I can share my screen, I suppose. So do you see my slides now? Yes. Yes, OK, great. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers of the webinar for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, uh, really honored to be the speaker today. Uh, the work I will present is about sampling from a density, mainly using the uh, Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, so, just a, a quick word about what it is. The picture that you see on this slide illustrates very well the phenomenon that I uh, analyzed in this paper. So, usually, what you have is uh, many trajectories of uh, a large one process which are drawn in this picture uh, that are running over the time and when we stop these trajectories at some time point like t equal to 30 here on the picture and we draw the histogram of the obtained points we can see that this histogram is very close to a target density function which is a v model curve which is drawn here and the goal of the paper was to try to find some non-asymptotic guarantees between the distance uh, that we have, I mean, all the, the distance between the histogram here and the target uh, density curve. Okay. Uh, and so the uh, method that I analyzed in the paper is named after Paul Langevin, which is a famous French physicist that you uh, see here on this picture, the second uh, from right, so from left, uh, holding his head. Um, let me start with a, a very quick introduction, just explaining the problem, uh, introducing uh, in, uh, the notations and also giving some motivations. Imagine that you have a very simple task to solve. You want to generate samples from a one dimensional exponential distribution. So what you do in R, you just type the uh, instruction Rxp with the argument, say 1000, it will output you a vector of 1000 uh, values, which are randomly uh, selected from uh, the uh, real line. And then if you draw the histogram of these 1000 real numbers, then you obtain a curve which looks like that. If you superpose this histogram with the probability density function of the exponential distribution, you see that it fits very well the histogram. Okay, so in this picture, the curve which is here is just the exponential of minus theta, which is the formula of the probability density function of the exponential distribution. Okay, so in a one dimensional setting, if you have a standard distribution, you have this uh, instructions in, in R that you can use for uh, sampling points from given probability densities. But the question now, what happens when you are in a higher dimensional situation? So imagine that you have uh, the closed form expression of a probability density function in a 50 dimensional space, and you want to draw 1000 points from this probability this density function. So when the dimension is uh, large, this problem is a complicated one. And this is exactly uh, the one that has been analyzed in this uh, paper of 2017. So the mathematical formulation is the following. We have a probability density function pi defined on a p-dimensional Euclidean space Rp. The goal is to generate one random vector capital X, which is drawn from pi. This problem uh, arises 
in many different applications, three of which are listed here. Uh, the first one that I was uh, mainly interested in when I studied this problem was the one of uh, Bayesian statistics, where sampling from the posterior distribution is an interesting uh, question because it, it helps us, first of all, to uh, visualize the nature of the posterior distribution. And secondly, these samples can be uh, combined for computing like the uh, coordinate was median or, or the, the mean or the uh, empirical covariance matrix. The second application is uh, in generative modeling, which is a, a very popular uh, task now in, in machine learning. The goal there is to try to generate samples which are similar uh, to those which are contained in the training sample, but which are not identical to those. Uh, one of the applications, for instance, is to generating uh, photorealistic face images uh, as uh, the ones which are uh, displayed here in the second picture. Uh, having in the training data set the images or the faces of some celebrities. Uh, one popular approach for solving this problem is called energy-based generative modeling, in which the goal is to first estimate an energy function, and then to assume that the probability density function of the sample is just the exponential of uh, the negative energy, and uh, try to sample from this probability density function. And finally, a third uh, example of application is in multi-armed bandit problem, where uh, the Problem formulation is the following. There are, say, capital K distributions. You can get samples from each of them on request. And your goal is to find out which distribution has the highest mean in order that uh, request samples only from this highest mean distribution. One of the optimal approaches for uh, solving this problem in a parametric setting is called Thompson sampling algorithm. Uh, this algorithm requires at each step to sample from a probability distribution function, which can be written in a closed form. Okay. So there are several applications of uh, the sampling problem. I listed here only three of them, but there are many, many others. Uh, now, um, I wanted also in this talk uh, to understand and to, to explain what's, in my opinion, the main reason why this paper received uh, much more attention in the literature than the other papers that I wrote. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons is that this paper uh, established the bridge between the two, two fields of applied mathematics. The first one is computational Bayesian statistics in which people were studying Monte Carlo methods since at least uh, 60 years or more. Uh, and the second field is optimization. And it turns out that in a machine learning community, optimization methods were studied much more than uh, MCMC methods. And this paper tried to show that uh, optimization is very close to sampling. And many methods which are uh, used in optimization can be also helpful in sampling. And also the mathematical theory which has been developed in optimization can serve to obtain uh, better results in the problem of sampling from a given density. And to explain the relation between optimization and sampling, let's uh, consider the setting when the target density pi depends on some parameter tau and has the form which is written here, so it's proportional to the exponential of negative uh, v theta divided by tau. So v here is a potential function, and the parameter tau is often interpreted in physics as a temperature parameter. So when this temperature parameter goes to zero, what's happening here is that if we assume that the potential function has a unique minimizer, then the probability density function pi tau will converge to the direct mass concentrated at this minimizer. So 
if we manage to sample from pi tau with a very small value of temperature parameter tau, it will be equivalent to uh, computing the minimizer of the potential function. Okay, so this shows basically that if we manage to solve the optimization problem, uh, sorry, if we manage to solve the sampling problem, even approximately, it will give us an approximate solution of the optimization problem. So uh, in, in a sense, it means that like optimization is a particular case of sampling or optimization is kind of simpler than, than sampling. Uh, but of course, that in, in, in these two problems, the uh, measures of the quality of the procedures are not the same. And uh, interestingly, it has been shown in a paper by Ma and co-authors in 2019, that in some interesting cases, uh, sampling can be faster than optimization. Of course, it's not uh, true in general. In uh, more general settings, optimization uh, can be uh, performed faster than, than sampling. But the two are very much related, and the uh, goal of the paper was to show this relation. OK, so now to be uh, more precise, so the goal uh, of the remaining part of this talk will be to uh, present the main result of the paper and also to briefly discuss some follow up papers, uh, which, in my opinion, uh, establish the most significant improvements and extensions of uh, the main results of this 2017 paper. Uh, and yeah, I wanted also to insist that uh, one of the important things uh, in this 2017 paper is just to say, let's consider conditions on the probability density function, which are essentially much simpler than the conditions that have been uh, considered before, but under which we can uh, get some uh, uh, simpler guarantees, some better guarantees, and also uh, so these uh, conditions should be so that uh, many different practical examples of Bayesian statistics, for instance, satisfy these conditions. And uh, it turns out that in the theory of optimization, especially the one which is very much used in uh, machine learning, a uh, very conventional assumption was that the potential function that one tries to optimize is smooth uh, and convex and even strongly convex. So if we translate this assumption uh, into the language of sampling from a density, it amounts to require uh, that the logarithm, the negative logarithm of the uh, probability density function is uh, gradient smooth and uh, strongly convex. So in other terms, we will assume that the probability density function can be uh, written as up to a multiplicative constant, the exponential of minus f. This function f is kind of the negative log likelihood or negative log posterior distribution. And it is assumed that this function ha f has a Hessian matrix, which uh, has uh, eigenvalues uh, which are between small m and big M. And these two constants, small m and capital M, are both strictly positive and finite. Okay. Uh, and the goal is to try to approximate this uh, target density function pi by another density function mu, such that we can efficiently sample from mu, which means that we can compute some samples which are drawn from mu in a time which is polynomial uh, in like dimension, in condition number, in, and in different other parameters, and such that this sampling density mu is within a distance epsilon of the target density pi. Epsilon is a small number which is given beforehand, and the distance here in this paper uh, was the total variation distance on the space of uh, probability measures. Okay, so uh, this condition C is really uh, the key of the paper, and related to that, the ratio of a capital M over small m 
is also an important parameter of the problem, which is usually referred to as um, the condition number of the problem. And it's denoted by kappa. Of course, it's larger than one. Okay, so now uh, there was a starting point for uh, my work was uh, the fact that one can easily uh, realize that, especially when I started, I, I, I taught a, a lecture, a, a course on optimization. And I realized that in the optimization uh, theory, there are some very easy to formulate guarantees for some simple methods like gradient descent, which show how many steps of gradient descent or, or how many evaluations of the gradient of the cost function are enough for getting an accuracy equal to epsilon or smaller than epsilon. And the theorem looks like the following. So if we perform a gradient descent up to an iteration k, so the gradient descent is given by the formula 2 here, then if we want to have a kth iterate, which is in a ball of radius epsilon of the initial value theta star, oh, sorry, of, of the optimal value theta star, then it's enough to perform a number of iterations, which is of the order of the condition number multiplied by a, a logarithmic term. Okay. So a very simple uh, condition uh, in which all the constants are explicit, all the constants are small, uh, and it doesn't depend on dimension, and it depends only linearly in the condition number and logarithmically in the inverse of the precision. Okay, so all these features are really very attractive. And this was exactly the kind of result uh, which was missing in the literature uh, on uh, sampling from a probability density function. And the question was, can we guarantee something similar? Uh, just to a very brief overview of the kind of results which uh, one can find at that time in, in the literature on sampling. So this is a very nice paper by uh, Ruba B and Heyer in which uh, an MCMC algorithm has been studied. It's uh, the Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm. And the type of result uh, which has been proved is exactly the uh, similar to what uh, I was interested in. So uh, uh, an inequality saying that after k iteration, uh, the sampler will be close to the target density pi, and uh, the distance between these two is upper bounded by something. Um, the like two points that I wanted to improve in this kind of results was uh, the first that I underlined here. So this result just says there exists positive constants rho c1 and c2 such that this inequality holds. So nothing else is said about these constants, in particular, nothing about their dependence on the dimension, nothing about their dependence on the condition number. And also, uh, these constants are, I mean, the, the results only says that these constants exist. No quantitative evaluation of this constant is done in this kind of uh, theorems. But this is quite natural because you know, I mean, in this theorem, it's written under natural assumptions, and the conditions that have been considered as natural in the MCMC literature at that time were not the same as the conditions that were considered as natural in optimization theory. Like here, I showed the main assumptions of that paper, and here you see that, like, uh, there are many of them. Some of them look a little bit like uh, the uh, convexity assumption, which I mean, you see the con condition C here, which is on the second order derivative of the potential function, uh, which uh, kind of looks like a convexity, but they are not the same. And under uh, such weak assumptions, it's really hard to hope uh, that one could get uh, guarantees which were as say, elegant as those in the optimization theory. Now, let me explain uh, a bit more in detail what uh, I did in, in my paper. So first of all, the uh, first uh, idea was to say, OK, so the algorithm which 
has these nice properties in optimization is the gradient descent. What is the equivalent of this algorithm in the problem of sampling from a target density? And it, I mean, it was very well known already in MCMC literature that the counterpart of gradient descent is the uh, Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm, which uh, has also the name of unadjusted Langevin algorithm. And it is basically uh, given by the following recursive uh, formula. So at each uh, step, k plus one, uh, what is done is the gradient of the value of uh, the potential function is evaluated at the previous step theta k multiplied by a step size h, and this quantity is subtracted from the case iterate. So if we just do this, it's gradient descent. What's different in the Langevin algorithm is that a random noise is added. And this random noise, it's important, it should have a magnitude which is uh, of a precise form of square root of 2h, where h is the step size, the same uh, h, which is in front of the gradient here. And another important point is that these random perturbations are independent, independent of the initial value, and they should be standard Gaussian vectors. Okay, so. This is the very basic form of the unadjusted uh, Langevin algorithm or Langevin Monte Carlo. You see here that there it based on two parameters, the step size age and also the number of iterations. So how many iterations should we do in order uh, to achieve a precision of epsilon? And of course, the number of iterations that we do will also uh, correspond to the computational complexity of the algorithm because at each iteration we should do one evaluation of the gradient, and the evaluation of the gradient is usually the most costly computation in this kind of algorithm. So another version of the algorithm that I considered in the paper is the Ozaiki discretization of the uh, large one Monte Carlo. The uh, main idea is that if we have uh, also evaluations of the Hessian, then we can use these evaluations of the Hessian of f in order to improve the convergence of the algorithm, but I will uh, not uh, talk too much about uh, this second order method in this talk. Um, okay, of course, I mean, this Langevin-based uh, MCMC algorithm has been widely studied in the literature. Here, uh, I selected some works that really influenced uh, my, my, my work and that I liked a lot when uh, I was working on, on those topics. Uh, you see that there were papers by, by Strummer, Tweedy, Roberts uh, on this topic. And uh, as I told already, most of them show under which conditions one can prove geometric convergence of the Langevin algorithm. And they also try to relax as much as possible the conditions under which such a geometric convergence can be obtained. Uh, just a quick overview of the contributions of uh, the paper of 2017. So it has been proved uh, that if we use the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm with uh, only the uh, gradient evaluations, then the number of iterates in the strongly convex case, which are sufficient for getting a total variation distance smaller than epsilon, is of the order of dimension over epsilon squared. And in the case where the function f is not strongly convex, but simply convex, then the number of iterations which are uh, sufficient is uh, p to power 3 divided by epsilon to power 4. And these results are improved if we have uh, the Hessian oracle, if we compute also the second uh, order derivatives, uh, then in the strongly convex case, the number of iterations is p over epsilon, and in the convex case, it's p over epsilon to power five divided by two. Okay, so these results uh, were obtained in my paper, assuming that a uh, warm start is available, but I uh, decided not to define here in this talk what the warm start is, because in a very, um, so in a paper written very uh, shortly after the mine, uh, Alain uh, Duramus and Eric Moulin, prove that this condition of uh, uh, so warm start can be uh, removed and uh, with a cold start one can obtain exactly the same rates as well. Okay, now let me uh, 
give the more uh, precise formulation of uh, the main result. So the main result says basically the following. Assume that we are running the uh, Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm with a uh, step size H, which uh, satisfies, uh, with, sorry, with a step size H and a number of iterations K, which satisfies the two inequalities which are written on this slide. Uh, so you see that for uh, these two inequalities to be satisfied, we should know the capital M and small m, uh, the dimension P, and the precision epsilon. Okay, so if usually if we are in a Bayesian statistics uh, setting, we have the closed form formula of uh, the posterior distribution and posterior density. It's reasonable to assume that we can have access to those parameters. Then we choose like H and K in this way. We uh, new here is the distribution of the uh, first, so the initial value of the LMC algorithm. Then what the CRM says that after K iterations, the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm has a distribution which is within uh, distance epsilon of the target distribution pi. And the distance is measured in total variation. Okay, so uh, a nice feature of uh, this inequality, which really uh, differentiates it with respect to what uh, was already available in the literature, is that first, all the constants here are explicitly given. Uh, second, all the numerical constants are small. So just to compare, there have been some results in uh, theoretical computer science literature, namely by uh, Laszlo Dovash and Santosh Vempala, in which these kinds of results have been obtained with explicit constants, but which were really uh, prohibi prohibitively large, like 10 to power 30. Uh, while here, I mean, all the constants are very small. The dependence of the number of gradient evaluations k on the dimension is just linear up to the logarithmic factor. So this was also a very uh, important point because most applications in machine learning of, uh, of sampling uh, concern situations where the dimension is very large. So, uh, and also, yeah, another important thing is that the MCMC algorithm, which is used to achieve these guarantees, is a very simple one. It's just the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. Okay, now uh, I think that I can spend uh, uh, just one minute in order to say what is the relation of this algorithm to the uh, Langevin diffusion process. Uh, so this Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm can be seen as the Euler discretization of a stochastic differential equation which describes the Langevin dynamics. So the Langevin diffusion process is the process LT which is defined by uh, the stochastic differential equation, which is written in this boxed formula. So in which you have a drift term, which is just the negative of the gradient of F, and a diffusion term, which is constant. And it turns out that if the potential function F satisfies the Lipschitz gradient and strong convexity assumptions, then this stochastic differential equation has a unique strong solution, which is a Markov process. And furthermore, this Markov process um, is ergodic and its stationary distribution is exactly equal to the exponential of minus a. Okay? Uh, so the fact that this Markov process is uh, strongly ergodic means that uh, in exponentially fast, the distribution of LT will converge to the stationary distribution, even if the distribution of L0 is very far away from the target distribution pi. Okay. And the uh, speed at which uh, the convergence of these distributions occurs is uh, characterized but by a very elegant inequality that is written on the last uh, line of this slide, which basically says that if the target 
uh, the density is strongly log concave with a uh, log concavity parameter small m. Then the distribution of the Largeman process at time t and the uh, stationary distribution have a distance measured in total variation upper bounded by uh, this quantity here in which you have this last term, which is the only one which depends on the time, which goes to zero exponentially fast in time. So the convergence in time is exponential. And the first term that we see here is just the kullback leibler divergence between the initial distribution and the stationary one. Because of course, if we start from the stationary distribution, then the total variation distance, which is at the, at the left of the inequality, is always equal to zero. Okay, so. In continuous time, if we can really sample a path of the Langevin diffusion process, the problem of sampling is very simple. Just compute L subscript T. What's more difficult is that usually we cannot have a continuous time path of this diffusion process. We have to discretize. And the whole work in, in this paper was to uh, combine this inequality or more precisely, the one which has been used in the paper was a loser one. This one was later proposed by Alain Derrick. And to combine it with a distance on the discretization of the Langevin diffusion process. Okay. So here I have a couple of slides which describe the discretization. I will not go too much into this. I will simply say that in order to measure the distance between the discrete version and the continuous time process, what has been used is just the Gersano formula combined with the PCR inequality in a very simple, simple way. And it gave a result which was kind of uh, almost unimproved up to a logarithmic term. Now, uh, I think that. I have still uh, three minutes to talk about some extensions and some follow up work that I like a lot. Uh, so the first one I already mentioned several times is uh, the work by Alan Diomius and Eric Moulin. I mentioned here one of their papers which has been published in Berlin in 2019. There is another one. Uh, published in the Annals of Applied Probability of 2017 as well. And as I already told, they have many different extensions of uh, the results of my paper. And so among probably the most uh, simple ones to describe are uh, the fact that they extend uh, the warm, style, uh, warm start scenario to any starting point. They uh, managed to consider also the case of the Wasserstein distance, while in my paper only total variation distance has been considered. And they also considered uh, so large run processes with varying steps, while in my paper only constant step size is considered. Another uh, extension that I found very interesting is this paper on under that launch one MCMC by uh, Xiang Cheng uh, and co-authors in which it has been shown that the under version or the kinetic version of the launch one Monte Carlo allows to uh, achieve similar results with a number of evaluations of the gradient which has a better dependence both on uh, the dimension and on the precision level. Uh, there is also this nice paper by Alain and co-authors in which they use uh, some techniques of convex optimization on the space of measures in order to improve several things, including the dependence of the Large Monte Carlo algorithm on the uh, condition number. Uh, this randomized midpoint method by Shen and Li uh, to the best of my knowledge, is the one which gives uh, by now the best dependence on dimension and on epsilon. It, but it changed the method actually. It uh, in, uh, in incorporates uh, an intermediate step in which so you use you don't use really the Euler discretization of the stochastic differential equation, but 
you introduce a randomized midpoint and you evaluate kind of the approximation of the gradient at this randomized midpoint. And also, uh, I like a lot this last paper by um, Santosh Vempala and Andre Vibisono, in which they show basically that you can remove a strong convexity condition on F, you can replace it by um, log Sobolev inequality, and you get exactly the same guarantees. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnak. And uh, so we'll now go over to Hani Doss, who will um, give a discussion. Oh, I think you, sorry, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Hani, you're, you're muted. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yes, thanks very okay. much. Would you please make this uh, a single? Yes, thank you. Um, the use of variational inference in place of Markov chain Monte Carlo has increased rapidly in recent years. And I would like to look at Arnock's paper in this context. But first, I'd like to give a one slide overview of the paper. Next page, please. Uh, Virtually all papers in the literature on rates of convergence of Markov chains to their invariant distribution fall into one of two categories. In the first category, these papers produce non-asymptotic results, as in Arnock's paper. Such papers give precise rates of convergence, but they typically deal with discrete settings. For example, random walks on a group of permutations and things of that sort, and they don't give the kinds of results that are usable in statistical applications, as in Bayesian statistics. Um, the second category of papers that produce um, rates of convergence, uh, in this category, uh, they, they typically deal with continuous settings, as we see in Bayesian statistics, and they say that there exist constants A and B, such that in total variation distance, you get uh, an exponential rate to zero. But as Arnak mentioned many times in his talk, the papers don't give explicit values for the constants A and B. Next page, please. So the this paper, um, Ar Arnak's um, GRSSB paper, which has gotten about 500 citations so far, is remarkable in that it brings the best from the two categories, albeit under strong conditions on the target distribution. Next page, please. So now I would like to talk about uh, two kinds of algorithms for estimating posterior distributions in Bayesian statistics, or more generally. Um, I'd like to talk about Markov chain Monte Carlo and variational inference. Um, so suppose that pi is a probability distribution on the space X. Crudely speaking, current methods uh, for estimating pi fall into two categories. One is MCMC. And these have the feature that as the number of iterations goes to infinity, the estimate is consistent. But for complex problems, each, iterate, each iteration can be computationally costly, and that precludes having a large number of iterations especially for slowly mixing chains. Next page, please. Uh, methods on variational inference. Um, th these, these have, the, the use of these has increased dramatically in the last, the last decade or so. And um, now is a good time to think about why this has happened. In variational inference, we consider a convenient family of finite dimensional distributions, call it Q, on the state space. And we seek the member of that family, which is closest to the target in call black liver divergence. And the optimization is done through an iterative scheme. These methods are fast. However, as the number of iterations goes to infinity, they converge, but not to the target. Because in general, 
the target is not in a space for which you're seeking the best answer, estimates produced by variational, variational inference have a bias. Next page, please. So to summarize what was on the previous page in just a few words, uh, methods based on MCMC are slow, but or can be slow, but asymptotically they target the right quantity, whereas methods based on variational inference are fast, so they can deal with very big problems, but they target an incorrect quantity, even asymptotically. Next page, please. So, <clears throat> in um, for Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, Arnak didn't, didn't talk about this a whole lot, but you can get estimates of variance. There are spectral estimates for, for variance, and so it's possible to get a handle on the size of the error. By contrast, in contrast, for variational inference, there's no way to get a handle on the size of the bias. Now, some people are dead set <clears throat> on using variational inference, um, and others are equally adamant that MCMC should not be used. And the issue has become, um, to a certain extent, a matter of religion, to the point that, uh, for example, some referees dismiss papers on MCMC without really reading them. And I've seen this myself personally as an associate editor for Series B. Uh, next page, please. So my first question, I have two, and I don't think that we'll have time for both, but uh, we can discuss one of them. My first question is, do you think there's any hope in getting guidance on which approach to use for a given problem? And my second question, next page please. Um, Arnock's paper gives explicit bounds on the convergence rate under an assumption, the convexity assumption that, that is made, that implies that the target distribution is not multimodal. And I hasten to add that uh, the same assumption is made in the optimization theory for getting rates of convergence. And my question is, is there any hope of weakening this assumption? And those are my comments. Thank you very much, Hani. Um, we'll give Arnak a chance to reply at the end, but um, before that, let's, um, let's have our uh, next speaker, Alain uh, Dermus. Do you, uh, I don't think you have slides, is that right? I have slides, in fact, you I just picked up yesterday. Okay, okay. <laughs> so normally, in fact, Chiara, could you share my slides because I don't... Yes, know. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, so we'll proceed as Danny, as I need not to lose time. So I will be more brief than Annie, which in fact summarizes, I think, very well Anax paper. And okay, it's a very beautiful paper. I would like, of course, because it, it was at the basis, in fact, of my PhD thesis at some somehow, because okay, I was working on this topic uh, mostly on the same on the same time. And uh, so here, next uh, next slide, please. So I will just maybe. I prepare some of, uh, let's say, two, two main questions. And the first is, okay, which I uh, call Mala or Ula, that's, that, that is a question. Because, uh, so next, uh, next page, please. So just to, for those of you who don't really know what is uh, Mala briefly, so it's just LMC, but you incorporate the Metropolis filter step where okay, you just use the LFC proposal kernel as proposal inside the metropolis testing algorithm. And okay, it has been proposed and suggests in a couple of papers, mainly of, in fact, what is in very, very well known in statistics is a paper by uh, Robert and Tweedy in 1960s that Arnax just talk in this own talk. And uh, so uh, next page, please. 
And so under a very mild assumption on pi, you, you can show that, okay, this, uh, in fact, it's a metropolis testing algorithm. That's, so it's very uh, easy to show that under a very mild assumption on the target density pi, the distribution of the iterates converge to pi in a total variation distance, all right? And what uh, I was wondering is, in, and in fact, I didn't even try myself, is could you, is, uh, Anna, did you think about using your work in uh, the convergence of uh, of Mara, that's uh, my first question regarding okay, this uh, this topic. And the second one is maybe okay, and uh, it's not clear to me uh, as well. But it's currently, that uh, could we develop some kind of criteria saying that in which situation we should use one of these two algorithms? Okay, in which situation we should use Mara rather than uh, than LMC? So that's my second question on this uh, on this particular topic. Okay, next next uh, next uh, slides, please. And uh, so uh, my second question, but in fact, uh, Annie discussed uh, already a bit about this uh, this aspect, which is in fact to get uh, mean square error bounds guaranteed for uh, for LMC. So and I would like. Uh, to have, in fact, uh, an insight on, on this uh, particular question. So next, uh, next slide, please. So here, okay, I just recall, recall you the LMC array. So I took the same notations on Arnax, not to, to disturb you. And here, the, the goal, okay, if you, uh, is that I really want to try to, uh, to approximate uh, pi of f for some test function f and here I use, in fact, the empirical average based on some heat rates of, uh, of LMC. And OK, you can consider the mean square error for uh, the, uh, of, the, of my uh, obtained estimator. And here, OK, of course, basic statistics, you, you know that the mean square error can be decomposed into two terms. The first one is a BR square plus the variance of my estimator. So here, OK, based on your results, Arnak, you can easily round the BIAS. But okay, compare and now for the second term, you have also the variance. And what so, uh, okay, in my work, I uh, always, in fact, analyze this term using the uh, convergence of the Markov chain. But uh, did you, in fact, think about using directly your work to, to, to deal with this term? So that's what that is, in fact, my, uh, my second main, main question. And that would be uh, all for. Uh, for the moment, because I think we will not have the time to, to discuss the, the last aspect. So I will uh, I will conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do you think you could you mute, mute, mute Alan? Alan. Sorry? Could, 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 you could, you mute? could you mute? Ah, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There was just a bit of echo on the line. Um, OK, so um, perhaps we'll give uh, Arnak a, a chance to reply to the the questions and the comments that were raised, but it also if there's an, any um, questions or comments from the audience, if you type them into the chat, we can we can see if we have time to answer them at the end. OK, go, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, OK, so uh, thanks a lot for, for the discussions. Actually, all the questions that you raised uh, are very interesting questions. And of course, uh, I have already thought about those questions and uh, of course, these are also questions that do not have uh, simple answers, otherwise you wouldn't ask. Um, so I will share uh, some of my thoughts. Uh, they are highly incomplete, of course. Uh, and I really hope that I will have uh, time in the future to, uh, I mean, to do some work on those questions. Uh, I will start by the questions raised by, um, by Hani. Um, Maybe the easier question is the second one, uh, because uh, it just asks what's my opinion on the possibility of obtaining something. So, <laughs> uh, my opinion is that currently what we are, what we can do, is to say if a distribution satisfies the uh, log sobo of inequality. It doesn't need to be unimodal. It doesn't need to be uh, strongly uh, log concave. If it's simply uh, log sub OF, then you can have guarantees which are similar to those which are uh, 
in my 2017 paper. Okay, so these uh, results have been obtained first by uh, so Santosh Mempala and Andre Bimbisono, a paper that I uh, cited at the end of my presentation. But of course, it's not completely satisfactory because uh, can you really check that a distribution satisfies the logs of all of inequality? The answer very often is, I mean, either no, you can't, or it's very difficult. Uh, so, uh, theoretically speaking, there are distributions which are not unimodal for which fast sampling is possible. Uh, but for a given distribution to check that these conditions are satisfied is hard. Even for a very simple situation where you have the posterior distribution of the logistic model, uh, like, uh, I don't know, with the uh, uh, double exponential prior. It's not really uh, clear that it satisfies the log sample of inequality with which constant, etc. So even in these simple uh, cases, it's not it's, it's not easy actually to to check the log sample of condition. Um, so whether in a very complicated multimodal situation, we can hope uh, to have uh, some strong guarantees as in my work. I would say that uh, for me, for the next 10 years, it's hopeless. <laughs> I mean, before the time I will be retired, I think it's hopeless. Uh, but uh, what I also think is that under some specific conditions on the on the density function, it should be possible uh, even to do for some multimodal distributions. And also what I think is that, you know, for instance, what happens now with deep learning? All the people who are using optimization techniques, uh, they use in optimization algorithms which are proved to be optimal in the strongly convex situation. So the uh, most popular technique is gradient descent with momentum. Gradient descent with momentum is exactly the method which has been shown to be optimal for uh, optimization with strongly strong convexity. Yeah. Uh, so. This is uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, positive uh, remark. Uh, the aim of which is to say, if you uh, try to um, compare algorithms by their behavior in the simple situation where the uh, probability density function is strongly long concave, and you find that one of the methods is better than the others, it's probably a good idea to use this method even in a situation where the probability density function is not strongly log concave or not uh, unimodal. It's likely that even in the, these situations, it will give better results. At least this is a lesson that we can learn from the optimization. Um, now, if I uh, talk about the uh, comparison between uh, variational inference and MCMC, it's a very, very hard question actually, because uh, so what is uh, I mean, if we, really I put it to extreme, the extreme situation would be to say I have data points. I want to uh, sample from the distribution of these data points. I have two, uh, two, two uh, ways of doing that. Either I assume that these data points are from, come uh, from a Gaussian distribution. I can very easily uh, estimate the mean and the covariance matrix of uh, this uh, point cloud and then sample from a Gaussian distribution, which has uh, this empirical mean and empirical covariance matrix as mean and covariance matrix, right? So you can do this. It's very simple. It samples points from the same uh, set as the original points. And the second thing you can say, no, but my dis initial distribution is highly non-Gaussian, so doing that is not a good idea. So I have to estimate the uh, real density function of my point cloud and try to sample from this real uh, density. Uh, and of course, I mean, the first solution is a very simple one. It has a very high bias. The second one is much more complicated. And I think uh, it depends very much on the application one has in mind, which method should be preferred. Because in some situations, in some applications, uh, you can I mean, the fact that you generate some samples, you can visualize these samples and you can quantify, I mean, you can uh, just 
uh, at a qualitative way, say these samples are good. Just look at these samples and say, I mean, if you generate images, you just look at the image and you say, oh yeah, okay, this image looks like a real uh, uh, human being. So in those cases, I think you can really use variational inference. It will be fast. And if the visual uh, results are good, then you are okay with that. In some other applications, if you want to do some medical diagnosis or something like that, you want to have usually very uh, high accuracy uh, for your method, in the, and you don't have a visual evaluation of of the of the quality of uh, samples. Then it might be preferred to uh, rely on an MCMC when you can kind of guarantee the accuracy of the result. So I think that these are two extreme situations, but in practice, very often you are in the middle. <laughs> you simply have to decide between between these two. But in any case, uh, something that I can say is that from a mathematical point of view, in both questions, there are still a lot of things to do. And I think that any new mathematical result on both of these problems can uh, lead to a new guidance in this problem. Now, yeah, very quickly about uh, Alan's question. So the first one, uh, Eula versus Mala. Um, I did a number of experiments, uh, not too many because uh, most of my time I am spending for proving theorems, but sometimes I am doing also experiments. And in my experiments, uh, so Eula worked better always uh, than Mala did. So I don't know why, but this is what I what I observed. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, several recent papers. So there are old papers which say that yeah, uh, so Eula is of course biased, while Mala uh, converts to the true distribution exponentially fast under the right conditions. So from that point of view, Mala should be preferred. And also there are some recent papers that has been written after uh, my paper of uh, 2017, namely uh, the one by Dwivedi and Cossard from Stanford, in which they prove that for MALA you have also uh, non-asymptotic guarantees which have a dependence on dimension, which is as good, almost as good as for MALA, uh, and the dependence on 1 over epsilon is much better. So as expected, it's logarithmic in 1 over epsilon, instead of being polynomially in one of epsilon. Okay. So from a theoretical point of view, what we can draw from the existing result is that uh, so if, dim if the dimension is very high and you are not interested in having a very uh, precise uh, sampler, it's better to use EULA. Where the dimension is moderate, but you want to have a very precise uh, sampler, it's better to use MALA. Okay. So this is the uh, the guidance that we can uh, get from the currently existing results. And coming to the fact of uh, so mean squared error for LMC, um, it's really something that uh, I would like to be done by my, one of my uh, future PhD students to write a PhD thesis on that, like having simple non-asymptotic guarantees for uh, the estimator of the mean that you just wrote uh, on your slides. So, of course, I mean, there are some acceleration schemes that can be used to, to improve the error. It can be also uh, used, but really having user-friendly results for that problem is, I think, something very, very, very useful and still a bit missing in the literature. Maybe it's very complicated. I mean, it should be. It is complicated. That's why it's missing in the literature. But uh, probably there is something clever uh, to find which has not been found so far. That's all. Uh, thank you. Very good. Um, we do have one question in the chat so we'll i think we'll try and just squeeze it in if everyone has time and um, so this is uh, andre strakar who asks have you considered extensions to say inla or abc or bayesian synthetic likelihood uh, what would their performance be for your problem yeah thank you for the question actually uh 
the answer unfortunately will be very short because I have to answer negatively. <laughs> Uh, no, unfortunately, no, I didn't consider to have similar kind of mathematical analysis for the methods that you described. Um, it can be worth of doing so. The point is that in the analysis I did, uh, I really uh, used tools from the theory of stochastic processes, for, of diffusion processes, and it was uh, the key. When uh, you are doing ABC, uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, these tools would be really useful. So I think that something else should be uh, done in that case. Uh, it's really an interesting topic of research, but to my knowledge, uh, I, I personally didn't do anything in this direction. I, I'm not aware of people who, uh, who established guarantees which are simple, as simple as the one that I showed in this talk. Very good. Thank you. Um, I think we better wrap up there, uh, but I'd like to uh, thank all of the speakers and th thank everybody for, for coming. Um, yeah, I, I found that very enlightening and hopefully hopefully everyone in the audience did too. Um, OK, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.